Donc, euh, nous allons commencer. Je veux d'abord euh, euh, vous saluer à tous euh, de la part de toute l'équipe de TEIM et euh, de ceux qui ont fait que ce soit possible cette conférence annuelle donc, de TEIM avec trois conférenciers de premier ordre. Euh, nous allons d'abord euh, tout, de, tout de suite donc, euh, passer la parole lorsque Anne aura traduit en anglais euh, mes paroles la, à Joanne Domenech Rose, qui est présidente de l'IEC, qui fera un discours de, de bienvenue à ce qui concerne. Et puis ensuite, nous passerons donc, euh, aux trois conférenciers, en commençant par Andreu Domingo Ibais, euh, Xavier Bernard Sanz et euh, Maria Ubac Imortes. Donc, je cède la parole maintenant à Anne, qui va vous traduire en anglais euh, les paroles que je viens de dire. Merci. Good morning, everybody, also from my side. Uh, thank you very much, Martin. Uh, so Martin also welcomes all of you to the annual conference of the Transform to Euro Institute Network. Thank you very much for being with us today. And uh, thank you for the three speakers who are here with us today. Uh, Mr. Domingo, Mr. Savia Bernassens, and Maria Ubach. And um, we thank especially the um, uh, president of the IEC, who is here with us this morning, to uh, inaugurate the TAIN annual conference. Donc, président, quand vous voulez, ou président, quand vous voulez. Uh, bonjour, uh, good morning, bon dia, buenos dias. Benvolgudes i benvolguts membres de la xarxa TAIN, autoritats, col·legues, malgrat la situació que no ens permet trobar-nos físicament a causa de les limitacions que imposa la pandèmia, tinc el plaer de donar-vos la benvinguda per aquesta Assemblea General de la TEIN, xarxa europea de la qual l'Institut d'Estudis Catalans n'és membre. El context actual de la crisi sanitària de la Covid-19 és una preocupació per a tots. La pandèmia, que va començar a propagar-se des de la Xina a l'inici del mes de gener del 2020, va fer d'Europa l'epicentre a partir de març-abril d'enguany, amb una segona onada actual que planteja moltes preguntes fonamentals sobre la nostra societat moderna, la integració europea i les relacions internacionals. Des de fa mesos ens trobem, ho sabeu ben bé, immergits en una època d'incertesa. Fins ara havíem lluat els avantatges de la mundialització basada en la interconnexió creixent de països i persones, el comerç internacionalitzat i la mobilitat gairebé sense límits. Però la propagació de la malaltia provocada pel coronavirus, que l'ha convertit en un perill mundial pel seu descontrol a causa de l'augment de la mobilitat de les persones a nivell global, ha tornat a posar l'èmfasi en els desavantatges de la mundialització. Per la cooperació territorial europea, per les nostres fronteres, les conseqüències són importants. El precepte d'una Europa sense fronteres va trontollar ja el 2015 a causa de la crisi migratòria i el terrorisme. I va... Okay, while we're waiting for the president to come back, I might just um, read his speech in English to you. So okay. if he comes back, he can take back over if that's okay. So, um, dear members of the TAIN network, I'm just reading what he was saying, okay? <laughs> so, um, dear participants, Despite the situation that does not allow us to meet physically due to the limitations imposed by the pandemic, um, the president is pleased to welcome everybody to the annual conference of the TAIN, a European network of which the Institute for Catalan Studies is a member. And the current context of the COVID-19 health crisis is a concern for all. The pandemic had begun to spread uh, from China in early January 2020, made up to Europe its epicenter from March to April this year. This is the second current wave, which raises many fundamental questions about our modern society, the European integration and the international relations. We have been immersed in a time of uncertainty for months. So far, we have applauded the benefits of globalization based on the growing interconnections of countries and peoples, internationalized trade and almost limitless mobility. However, the spread of coronavirus disease has made this interconnection a global danger because of its lack of control. The pandemic has once again put the emphasis on disadvantages of globalization. For European territorial cooperation, for our borders, the consequences are important. The percept of a border, Europe without borders, was shaken as early as 2015 due to the migration and terrorism crisis and led to some control of the borders of the Schengen area. But this control was not permanent nor systematic. 
Nevertheless, with the COVID-19, the borders were really closed and with systematic controls. We knew the retreat to the nation states, everyone in their own home. The situations resulted in rejection behaviors by those who could come from the neighboring state. EU members did not know how to coordinate at first. There were immediate problems in the European border regions that have become in the framework of the European integration process spaces for traffic, mobility and communication. Cross-border transport, trams, trains, etc. were interrupted. Cross-border workers had difficulties to get to their workplace and were affected by administrative barriers in terms of authorization documents and by physical obstacles in terms of border controls. And I think he's back. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Maybe I finish quickly, what do you think? And then I give you the word again, Mr. President. I was reading the English translation of your speech while we're waiting for you, but you can also take up again. Espero que no està allà, eh? Val. Deia, els membres de la Unió Europea no van saber coordinar-se en un primer temps a causa de la pandèmia. Va haver-hi problemes immediats en les regions frontereres europees que s'havien convertit en el marc del procés d'integració europeu en espais de circulació, mobilitat i comunicació. Mitjans de transport transfronterers, tramvies, trens, etc. es van veure interromputs. Els treballadors fronterers van tenir dificultats per arribar al seu lloc de treball i es van veure afectats per obstacles administratius en termes de documents d'autorització i per obstacles físics en termes de controls fronterers. Les relacions transfrontereres han estat tallades per aquesta nova frontera que separa col·legues, amics i famílies. En definitiva, la frontera nacional s'ha convertit de nou en una barrera molt difícil de travessar. És veritat que en aquesta crisi sanitària les fronteres es van imposar a tot el món, també a nivell nacional, en l'àmbit privat, perquè el distanciament social semblava ser l'única possibilitat de contenir la propagació de la pandèmia. Tanmateix, imposar aquestes mesures de fronteres nacionals no coordinades a la Unió Europea és quelcom perillós. S'envia el missatge que l'amenaça per la salut està provenint de fora, com si el virus optés per infectar nacions i no persones, com si el virus es pogués aturar en una frontera nacional. Però tenim l'exemple positiu de l'Hospital Transfronterer de Puigcerdà, que es va convertir en un corredor sanitari. Cal treballar a partir del local amb els actors, i tenir en compte que l'espai transfronterer és un laboratori que pot servir en temps d'incertesa per prendre decisions solidàries a cada banda de la frontera. Per tot això, us desitjo bona feina i que els resultats de l'Assemblea General puguin ser útils per resoldre alguns dels problemes suara esmentats. Realment, espero que ara hagi arribat bé. Sí. Moltes gràcies, president. Moltes gràcies. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Ross, uh, for these kind words. I just wanted to repeat in English, if you don't mind, the last uh, sentence you said, because I think it's really important. Uh, you said it is necessary to work locally with the local actors and keep in mind that the cross-border space is a laboratory that we can be used in times of uncertainty to make solidarity decisions on each side of the border. And I thank you very much for this platform this morning and the organization of this uh, you know, annual conference so that we can actually really talk about these opportunities. Thank Thank you so much. Thank you, Anne. Molt bé. Maybe I can use the opportunity <laughs> to um, just say uh, two words about the Transfrontier Chain Network, so the Transfrontier Year Institute Network, for those who don't know um, the network yet. Um, it's a network of um, uh, 50 members and three associated members that bring together research institutes and training institutes, um, all across uh, Europe uh, from nine different border regions um, in order to exchange um, between different borders and uh, look at the best practices and learn from each other in order to facilitate cross-border cooperation and transfrontier cooperation all across Europe. And I'm very pleased to have uh, this uh, this conference this morning with all of the great speakers. And I just wanted to say two technical things to the participants. So if ever you have any technical problems, so please don't hesitate to uh, write in the chat to Ernest, he can help you with any connections and all of this. And um, please, if you have any questions to the three different speakers that will be coming up soon and that Martina will uh, present to all of you, um, please write um, any questions or remarks in the chat so that we can then, um, after each presentation, have a little discussions with the speakers and on the different topics introduced. Thank you Thank very you much. much.
It's up to you, Martine. <rire> C'est à toi. <rire> Bien, maintenant, nous allons commencer donc, les, les conférences et nous allons commencer par André Domingo Ibais. Alors, qui est André Domingo Ibais C'est un sociologue qui est spécialiste des migrations internationales. Il est directeur adjoint depuis 1997 du Centre d'études démographiques, le CET. Il est professeur associé au département de géographie de l'Université autonome de Barcelone. Il est membre de l'Institut de Studies Catalans euh, et secrétaire de la section philosophie et sciences sociales. Et depuis hier, officiellement, il est membre du, com du conseil scientifique de l'Institut de Studies Catalans. À toi, Anne, pour traduire ce petit, ce bref CV de André <rire> Domingo. Thank you very much, Martin. So we are very happy to welcome uh, Mr. Domingo this morning, who is a socialist specializing in international migration. Um, since 1997, he has been the deputy director of the Center for Demographic Studies and associate professor in the geographic department of the Autonomous University of Barcelona. Um, he's also a member of the Institute of Catalan Studies and the Secretary of the Philosophy and Social Science section. And we thank you very much, Mr. Domingo, for being here with us this morning. And we look very much forward to your perspective on the COVID crisis in Catalonia. Thank you so much. You have the floor. First of all, I, I want to, to thank uh, the organizers, the Transfer Care uh, Euro Institute Network and the Institute uh, for Catalan Studies, especially Martina Comiat, who have uh, given me the opportunity to share with you some uh, thoughts about the impact of uh, COVID-19 in Catalonia, more than evidence. And uh, I, I prepared a uh, uh, conference in five uh, parts. In the first one, uh, as an introduction, I'm going to say, tell you some words about the political context uh, of uh, health in Catalonia and, the, and what I, I call the gray swan of COVID-19. Uh, after, I, I'm going to, to show you some of the impact of the three main uh, demographic phenomena, mortality, fertility, and immigration. And at the end, I'm going to make a kind of balance and some pro perspective. Uh, start with political context uh, of health system in Catalonia. For those that uh, don't know, it's, uh, it's important to say that in 1981, the, sta the Statute of Autonomy recognizes the transfer of health to the Generalitat of uh, Catalonia, to the autonomous government. And in 1983, the, it's created the Catalan Institute for health, uh, which is the instrument that aims to guarantee the health of population living in Catalonia. On March 14, 2020, the declaration of a state of alarm by the Spanish government means in fact the recentralization of the autonomous model. It means that uh, after uh, 39 years of autonomous in uh, health uh, policy, uh, it started uh, a big tension uh, in, in order to, uh, to uh, say what uh, measure has to be done uh, to fight against uh, the pandemic. Uh, this tension is between central government and autonomous government of Catalonia that adds to the economic crisis uh, and the debate about the private and public model and also, as you know, the independence uh, movement. I'm not going to focus in this uh, context because I'm um, focusing in, uh, in demography, but what uh, I want to say uh, before starting is that uh, and, uh, to think about the impact of, uh, of uh, the pandemic in Catalonia is important to, to think about fa past, what has been done in, uh, in health in the past, uh, about incertitude, uh, what, what we don't know about uh, pandemics, and uh, what we are doing now. This is the most important thing. 
in order to, in, in general, not only in, in Catalonia, and uh, from the demographic uh, point of view, the most important is uh, why I consider uh, a gray swan. I, uh, I think it's a gray swan because uh, pandemic is a global risk considered consider unlikely but predictable. If uh, we think in the previous pandemic episodes of 2004 and 2006, of uh, avian influence uh, was previs uh, previsible. Uh, the second is the collapse of public statistics. Uh, rec first, the recognition of the cause of death, uh, but also in the data collection and the publication, not only in mortality, also in uh, fertility and in uh, migration rates that is a problem for demographers because we depend on public statistics. So explains the, the popularity of big data and APPs in order to control mainly the mobility and the social context of population. But uh, it has some problems. The first is uh, the lack of the sociodemographic profile in the majority of these uh, big data sources. The second is that sacrifice the, the rigor for immediacy. You, you can understand because of the health emergency context, but it still is a problem. And at the end, you can think that uh, is benefiting uh, private sector over uh, public sector with uh, sometimes relative utility if we are thinking in the strategy of uh, health uh, situation. Uh, sorry. Uh, we're going to start with the phenomena. The first is mortality, as uh, uh, I said. And uh, oh, it's impossible with it. Uh, the first image that I have here is the evolution of the estimated number, number of deaths by week in different years. In black, you have the 2020 uh, year. And now we, uh, you can see uh, clearly the over mortality that is uh, around the middle of the May. The May. Uh, we estimate uh, that if we compare the mortality of this year with previous years, we have uh, 14,000 and 500 uh, uh, deaths more, uh, which represents a 38% uh, more mortality only in the first wave. Um, uh, we have no uh, data on the second wave, we are, but uh, if we see the peak of uh, the uh, second week of May, it, it reaches about uh, 4,400 uh, deaths. And the last week in November, we had uh, the order of uh, 470 by, uh, by this, no? But uh, the, the second uh, thing is uh, the age and sex distribution of the COVID cases in Catalonia. If you just uh, see the first parameter of uh, age and sex, you can see uh, that the distribution is in absolute numbers. Uh, the 40, 49 years old is the more, the majority of the people has been uh, affected by the COVID. But if you see in relative numbers, you see that uh, the big impact is in the elderly uh, years, 19 and, and plus. And uh, even if uh, we uh, translate the deaths in the mortality rates, we can see as in the number of rates, you have more uh, deaths in the case of uh, elderly women 
but in the tax mortality in, uh, in relationship with the uh, total number of uh, effectives in these uh, uh, years, you have that the most uh, important uh, effect is in males, in not in, in women. Uh, you have uh, 5,700 uh, uh, by uh, 10,000 population uh, for males and for 437 for uh, women population. The, the most important is uh, how to translate this death in the life expectancy. Uh, the estimates uh, of the Catalan uh, Institute of Statistics for the year 2020 was uh, to reach 20, uh, 84.2 years of life expectancy for males and uh, 86.5 uh, for women, which uh, uh, it represents a, a very uh, good uh, life expectancy in the European context for Catalonia. Uh, but the impact of uh, COVID, we estimate the Demographic Studies Center that uh, it, uh, it means uh, a loss of 1.39 uh, years in the case of the males, 1.37 years in the case of females, only in the first wave. If we add the second wave, we can think that we are going to reach a loss of in, uh, in the medium about 1.5 or 2.0. 2, uh, point uh, years uh, in the life expect expectancy, but uh, for us is a conjunctural uh, effect because as the mortality in uh, in Catalonia as well as uh, all the European countries is concentrated uh, in the last uh, years of uh, of life. Uh, there is, there is going to be a, a, a very fast recuperation of the life expectancy in the next years because there is an effect of uh, selectivity in, um, in death. And uh, we estimate that in 2050, we're going to, to reach uh, the level of 86 years old uh, for males and 90.2 uh, for uh, females. Uh, but what about uh, territorial distribution that can be the most interesting for the border departments or counties, comarcas in Catalan, uh, in the Catalan border with France and uh, Andorra? You can see, you can see uh, at the beginning that as mm, the population of this uh, uh, comarca is, is, uh, is age, the impact uh, is going to be uh, higher than other parts. But this map that I'm uh, showing to you is a an, uh, an calculation with the standardized uh, age which eliminates the age structure uh, bias. And then we can see, th this is uh, made by the Agencia de Qualitat i Evaluació Sanitària de Catalunya, the Quality and Evaluation Health uh, Agency in Catalonia. And what we can see is that the, the higher impact is in this comarca here, uh, that is the Anoia. Uh, that reach the 47.4 by uh, 10,000 inhabitants as an uh, impact. And uh, in absolute, and, uh, you, you can see uh, El Barcelonès, where is placed the, the, the capital city, Barcelona, but uh, the level is 22.9 uh, mortality rate. Uh, but if you compare with the levels of the comarcas, uh, the border comarcas, 
you see uh, that the defense is, is uh, very weak. Lala and Purda has fight only 5.5. The Payar Subira only uh, 0.7. The, the Al Rajel uh, 4.9. The, the Ripulies, that is the most, uh, who has most flows, uh, flows with uh, France, is only. Uh, no, the Sardinia 7.4 uh, and the Ripoulies 8.9. The higher in the border is uh, here the, the La Rocha with 16.1. Uh, uh, what is important is uh, very far from the levels of other uh, comarcas uh, of the inner Catalonia. What we can say about fertility? We can say uh, about nothing because uh, the, the data of fertility is, uh, of uh, birth are going to arrive uh, in the next uh, year. And uh, we have to expect uh, nine months at minimum to, to see what is the, uh, the impact on the birth. But uh, uh, what uh, can I say uh, first is that uh, Catalonia is one of the regions with lowest uh, fertility rates in, uh, in Europe and in the world. Um, you can see here the evolution of fertility rates by citizenship and see that in 2020, the level of the total fertility rate is, is this line, the blue, is only 1.29, that is uh, far uh, is lower than the 2.1 level, so-called level of replacement. Uh, in the case, oh, sorry, uh, in the case of the, the autochthonous uh, fertility rate that is the average of birth by woman, uh, you have only 1.17. And in the case of migrant uh, woman, you have uh, 1.67. It's higher, but uh, the tendency is to converge with the autochthonous fertility. And uh, in the future, what we expect is a, even a lower uh, level because two phenomena. The first phenomena is, uh, my hypothesis is that the, in the future is going to be a lower uh, level because of the pessimistic uh, uh, horizon uh, and because the entry of a, what the, the demographers call the white uh, or, the, or the weak um, generations with uh, less uh, number of uh, mothers, of, uh, of women uh, in age to be mother. And it's going to explain uh, a, a dramatic uh, 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 flow. Uh, in the media, they say, on the contrary, that this is going uh, to be a baby boom because of uh, the intimacy and the more time shared by couples with the confinement. But uh, I think is a, a, a thing to try to attract uh, attention uh, and make a narrative on the expectable and not in empirical data. And I, I don't believe so. Um, what about immigration? Immigration, we have the same problem uh, in order that we have no data now to know. It's, uh, it's evident that there has been a collapse uh, with the closure of the frontier of the borders. But uh, what uh, I want to say previous these speculations is that uh, we were in a second uh, migratory boom in the case of uh, Catalonia. 
Uh, here you can see international migration of people born abroad arriving in Catalonia from 2000 to 2019. And you can see uh, us uh, in the first part of the uh, new century, we reached in 2007 the maximum level with 2001, uh, 201,000 entries in uh, in 2007 the drop of uh, of the immigration flows because of the uh, economic crisis but uh, a fast recuperation from uh, 2014 to now but uh, the protagonists of these flows were uh, mainly latin american uh, uh, flows but in the second part, even if the Latin Americans are the most important also, uh, there are uh, different uh, reasons and different nationalities. In the first, uh, my opinion is that in the first part of the period, uh, the most important were the attract and the attraction um, factors. And in the second uh, part uh, are the expulsion factors. If you, you think that uh, one of the protagonists of this second boom is the Venezuelan uh, migrant, also Honduran, uh, because of the insecurity and the closure of the USA borders, but also Argentinian with the Macri neoliberal expulsion of people in Argentina. This is, was the immigration, but if you see the migratory balance, uh, we see that uh, even you uh, can see the, the effect of this second baby boom, I baby migration, the um, migration boom that I told you. Uh, in order, uh, the rest of emigration and immigration was most important still the the first, uh, the first boom of uh, in the first part of the millennia. Uh, what can I say about borders? I I can say uh, little things because the, because I have no data about mobility in the borders, but I can speculate uh, about two things. One is the importance that have second residences in the border uh, comarcas in Catalonia. And this uh, down to the special Spanish statistic registers about mobility that is based mainly in the municipal register, uh, uh, you can uh, expect uh, a kind of uh, uh, migration, uh, false migration from uh, central and uh, urban areas of Barcelona to the border uh, comarcas uh, in Catalonia, but is not, for me, is not a real movement. There are people that uh, in the time of uh, COVID uh, first wave, they decided to change the uh, municipal register saying that the second residence was the first residence and then now uh, uh, seems to be a movement in the register but I have my doubts that uh, this is going to be a uh, change in the lifestyle. Uh, I'm um, on the on the contrary of what media are saying that the, the, the it is going to be a, a break in the in the habits of uh, of the residents of Catalans uh, looking for uh, um, a, a new suburbanization of population and migration going to to the border uh, comarcs because of the facilities of uh, uh, telework. Uh, I think it's not, uh, at the end, it's not going to be uh, true. But, uh, but I'm ending. Uh, what's my final balance? 
But the, the important thing is that uh, when we uh, think uh, in general, when we speak about effects of uh, pandemia in demographics, all the people is thinking only in mortality and thinking that the worst uh, impact is going to be in death and in uh, lifespan. But uh, as I try to show it to you and try to explain for us, demographers is is only going to be a conjunctural effect in the short term. The loss of uh, life expectancy is going to be two years only. And uh, in long term, it's going to be an improvement and, uh, and a reach uh, in long term. It's not on the contrary, in, uh, in the fertility trends, I think uh, that COVID-19 is going to aggravate the crisis and the world trend in fertility because of these those things that I told you before. First, because the entry of empty generations in the future, and plus for the drop of migratory balance. Even if the migratory flows you know, are going to uh, um, increase in the future, pending on the recuperation of uh, economy, um, it is 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 difficult to reach uh, very fast this level of second uh, uh, second migratory boom, and uh, we have to add this tendency of the drop of uh, fertility rates in the migrator in the migrant women. What about migration? Uh, as I uh, told you, migration depends on the economic recuperation and the rhythm, and uh, it's the most difficult uh, previsible uh, demographic uh, phenomena because uh, it depends on the legal measures and the global, um, but also on the global pandemic situation. Uh, some countries, as Italy, they had a first estimation about what happened in the six first uh, or, or the four uh, first months in uh, immigration in Italy. And what we uh, said is a, a drop of the 90% of the migratory flows. But what was uh, interesting is not all the, the, the countries are uh, or not all the regions are uh, uh, doing the same. There are uh, origins that uh, the drop uh, is uh, being higher and others is being not so important. Uh, but in, uh, at the end, in short and medium term for Catalonian provisions is going to be a loss on uh, total population because as I said at the beginning, the, the evolution of total population in Catalonia depends uh, on migration. No? Uh, the final balance, we can uh, see dystopian or disruptive uh, uh, impact. And also at the end, uh, what I call utopic or more optimistic uh, scenarios. In the dystopian and disruptive scenarios, the first uh, thing is that we can expect an increasing of poverty and equality affecting the most vulnerable territories and population. E inside these populations, I am thinking in migrant population, even if the age structure is a younger one, but uh, they are more uh, concentrated in uh, uh, Res residents and, uh, and territories and uh, uh, sectors of productivity that uh, they have more contact or more uh, exposed to uh, pandemia. Uh, the second is that uh, I think is increasing the previous, uh, has been increasing the previous contradictions of the system. I, I, I mean the, uh, the economic system contradiction between demographic and social reproduction is a, a big uh, issue for us. 
And uh, the third is the increase of social fragmentation. Uh, first, the loss of confidence in a state because of the the fails of the failures on the measures taken against uh, pandemia. The second is because this uh, thing of the the confinement and the physical distance, uh, I think, is going to be a problem of what I call identity cocooning uh, with uh, migration, uh, uh, migrant population. And um, third is that this loss of confidence in the state uh, is going to, to, to um, increase the denialism and co confidence uh, theories. If we want to be optimistic, uh, some authors say that uh, it's going to be a big uh, uh, health uh, uh, moment in the future because they think in the black plaque in 14th century and uh, they say that uh, Renaissance uh, has been the reaction of the European population and the European societies to this challenge of the plaque. Yeah, and they expect uh, another jump in uh, in uh, European evolution, but I think it's a voluntarist uh, vision. This the second is uh, about the role of demography. I think that the more as we have to work for the restitution of social production of truth and public statistics, and be very critical with uh, media production of. Uh, post-truth. Uh, and um, the third and the most important, even if I, I can uh, give you little evidence, is that, uh, as uh, said the president of uh, the Catalan Institute, that the experience of cooperation is going to be a model for uh, follow to follow in the future that puts the, the importance in, in local linked with global is, is local knowledge and management who, uh, what can be a solution for, I'm thinking in the European uh, Union for uh, European Union decisions of management of pandemia. And that's all my, my friends. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Domingo, uh, on this uh, for this demographic uh, perspective on the COVID and also on the long term impact. Maybe I think that's very interesting in these times where we're really stuck in the in the current affairs and how we deal with this crisis on an everyday basis. To look maybe a little bit ahead and have a look what's going on in a couple of years. And there was one question in the. Um, in the chat that was a very concrete <laughs> it's a question ask uh, whether the um, french spanish and andorian border was closed during the first wave of the crisis as it has been the case for example on the french german border i don't know if i it's not my my special issue and uh, i don't know if i'm certain about it but uh, in the first times it was was uh, a closure of uh, borders, think, because the logic is the logic of the uh, nation state, but it was the same logic in, uh, in the case of Catalan uh, government and also the thinking in the, uh, the application of confinement in territories was the first uh, or the better guarantee to come to fight against uh, the the spread of the of the pandemic, uh, the problem is that uh, is the is a territorial scale for me, because uh, uh, the reality don't match only with uh, what is the state border, and uh, you have to manage different levels of territory to. Uh, uh, to follow the uh, what the epidemiologists that are they the the people that are more uh, have more knowledge about it 
who had to to decide and to be the expert to uh, to say uh, about this i think i don't know <laughs> thank you um there was a comment ex especially uh, exactly on the same um uh on the same um topic from uh, jordi Sikas. maybe jordi you want to take the floor and um say your comment out loud i think that could be interesting <laughs> yeah uh, uh, the, uh, good morning uh, 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 com a sociòleg uh, quina és la, la, la vostra opinió sobre totes aquestes declaracions que han fet uh, tants i tants polítics uh, europeus i segurament d'altres llocs que uh, el virus no 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 hi entén de, de fronteres, no? Per exemple, uh, Pedro Sánchez i la majoria dels ministres han dit i repetit mil vegades que este virus no entiende de fronteres, que no entiende de ideologies, etc. Però no només a uh, Espanya, sinó que la mateixa von der Leyen va dir a la CNN en una entrevista uh, this virus knows no borders, eh? aquest virus no no coneix fronteres ni nacionalitats. O fins i tot Macron en un discurs eh, televisat va dir si virus, eh, si virus n'ha fa de passport, eh, que no, no té passaport. Però a la vegada que estan dient això, eh, la primera cosa que fan és tancar les fronteres nacionals i tancar les fronteres exteriors de la, de la Unió Europea. I jo voldria saber la seva opinió sobre tot aquest tipus de declaracions, perquè clar, jo crec, em fa l'efecte que són, és molt contradictori no? amb el que diuen, amb el que llavors eh, acaben fent. I el fet aquest de trencar les fronteres eh, acaba potser provocant una, una, una percepció no? que el virus és una cosa que ve de fora i per tant això pot, i segurament està passant, que provoca xenofòbia no? contra dels immigrants perquè és, eh, són, venen de fora i per tant ens poden portar el virus que és bastant irracional. M'agradaria veure si pogués fer algun comentari sobre això. Uh, si, si li sembla, ara uh, repeteixo la pregunta en anglès per, per, per la resta de, de persones. I, I just, uh, I'd like to, to hear your opinion as a sociologist on the statements of many politicians about that the virus uh, knows no borders. For instance, uh, von der Leyen said to CNN in an interview that this virus uh, no, no borders and no nationalities. Also, Pedro Sánchez and many, many ministers in Spain have said many, many times that uh, el virus no entiende frontera, or the virus uh, knows no borders. Or even Macron uh, said, uh, se virus uh, n'ha pa de passport. Uh, but at the same time, uh, they, the first measure they they took in order to control the pandemic was to close the borders, the national borders and the external borders of the European Union. And uh, to me, it seems that um, this is not a good idea or, or maybe it's, it's, uh, it's not really effective because uh, well, the virus is already here and uh, it creates the idea that the virus comes from the, the, the outside. And so uh, this could be a, a, a cause for xenophobia. Uh, I agree with you. Uh, and this is do what I, I tried to explain before about the creation of national state narrative uh, that is uh, at the first uh, time was uh, thinking about in the case of Spain, but also in the France case uh, about uh, national unity and uh, in the case of Spain was the most exaggerated with uh, a representation of the army and the monarchy and uh, saying in the slogans that unity we are going to win the, the, the virus with unity and all this language military language and things like that and uh, saying that uh, at the same time that the uh, was not important, but at the same time that, that they saw that uh, borders were not important when they were, were thinking in uh, autonomous government of Catalonia, but uh, they at the same time uh, saw that it was important when they 
were thinking about migrants and they they decided to close uh, uh, borders but in, in the second round and they have the problem of the industry of tourism in the case of the Spain mainly, and then uh, try to differentiate what was the need of more tourists and then open the borders and, and uh, maintaining uh, close and bad uh, conditions for migrants that were working in the, uh, the countryside in the case of Catalonia in, in Lleida. Uh, this is only, but this is only one of the contradictions that uh, has been mobilized uh, with the, the pandemic. The other most important is, is this decision of uh, what I, I didn't speak before, this what I call the thanatopolitic uh, question. Is uh, the thanatopolitic question was uh, from the perspective of the state who is going to be uh, alive and who is going to let, which population we are going to let die, no? This brutal question uh, was clear in the case of uh, Trump or uh, Johnson or, or Modi in India, that they wanted at the beginning to reach the, the general uh, uh, expansion of the virus thinking that only uh, elderly people if it, it was not important were going to to die and uh, and thinking that uh, the economy was the first uh, uh, against uh, the life of, uh, of thinking i think that the two considerations one about territory and the second about population and life are in the center of governability. And why this is important to uh, have uh, experiences like border that uh, but show that is not so evident all this uh, narrative thinking only in neoliberal terms and in, uh, in uh, state uh, logic. I don't think I am. Uh, answering, but I thank you very much, uh, Mr. Domingo, for these uh, these remarks and explanations. I um, would like to move on to our next speaker. There will be time at the end to ask more questions and have more debate, maybe. Um, so thank you once again, mm -hmm. and I will give the floor again to Martina. <laughs> and donc, uh, on continue. On va maintenant donc euh, continuer les conférences avec Xavier Bernard Sens, que je présente très brièvement, comme André. Donc, il est directeur actuellement général de l'Eurorégion Pyrénées-Méditerranée, dont le siège est à Perpignan. C'est un homme euh, qui a 25 ans d'expérience à l'international et en gestion de projets et qui a derrière lui 10 ans à des postes de direction. C'est un homme précieux que nous avons à Perpignan. Voilà, à toi, Xavier. Et à toi, Anne, pour traduire, d'abord. Merci. Non, je vais le faire. Merci. Muchas gracias, Martina. Je vais le faire. Je vais le en anglais pour avoir un petit peu de break pour for Anne. Merci, uh, Martine. Merci, Anne, pour votre invitation. Vous m'entendez bien? Oui. Oui, vous m'entendez bien? Right. So uh, thank you, President, for, for your invitation. Uh, um, Mrs. Minister, Honorable Minister of the Foreign Affairs of Andorra, I'm really pleased to meet you again uh, years uh, after our uh, f first meeting at the CTP, the, common, the, um, the working community of the Pyrenees. So that's a real pleasure to be there. Uh, to speak to your network. I think that network as your network are really useful uh, to make the European uh, mind and the European, uh, uh, real, uh, European uh, idea a reality. Uh, so I think that our EU region is a small part of all the, all the actors, the key actors on the cooperation. So I will try to do my presentation 
focus on what we are because even if Martin says I'm really <laughs> precious, I'm not sure that everyone <laughs> knows uh, uh, the EU region. Uh, uh, even if I, I know very well the Institut Catalan de Studies as well as the EU Institute uh, Network, I would like to stress uh, what we are. I will share a presentation, a four point presentation, I'm hoping it is not too uh, hard to see. That's okay for you, Anne, if you see it. Okay. Uh, so far, we can't see your presentation. So Okay, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> so I will stress my presentation on the impact of the, on the territorial cooperation in the uh, EU region. Uh, as you see the map uh, here, you have the EU region. In the Xavier, Xavier yes? we cannot see your presentation, I'm sorry. Ah, you cannot. Okay, we sorry. cannot, sorry. Okay, sorry. I, I thought you say uh, you can see it. Sorry, sorry. Uh, let's see, uh, try again. So um, just uh, a map of our EU region, as you can see, uh, we are three uh, regional governments, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, the Occitanie region that has uh, the presidency of the region for a two years mandate, the Catalonian government and uh, certainly the Balearic Island uh, government that you can see on the south of the map. Um, the region is one of the first created in Europe. Um, it's uh, uh, almost uh, uh, 110,000 uh, square kilometers. It's uh, almost the size of a lot of countries in Europe. It's more than 15 million inhabitants and uh, it's a GDP, uh, altogether GDP of more than 40, uh, 430 million um, euros. Um, uh, why do I stress that? Uh, because um, as an actor of the cooperation, what are uh, seeking Europe is uh, partners, strong partners to, uh, in, to implement their policies. That's why the region, uh, uh, as you can see in this slide, is a key actor. First of all, we are one of the strongest R&D and research and development sector for, with more than uh, 600,000 students and 100,000 uh, uh, researchers, uh, one of the most important international level research infrastructure, uh, the ALBA synchrotron, um, the uh, European Space Agency, sorry. Uh, so we are one of the key actors in the innovation on the south of the Mediterranean. And that's very, uh, for us very important to, um, to develop a uh, pro um, project of cooperation. Another point that will be uh, one of the points more impacted by the COVID situation, uh, and I will um, talk about it later, it's the, touristic, um, the tourism and the touristic um, uh, industry. Uh, as you may know, uh, altogether, it's more than 4, 52 million uh, tourists in uh, 2019. And if you show uh, or you look at the figures uh, this year, for foreigners, uh, tourists, for instance, in the Balearic Island, they, they drop from uh, almost 20 million uh, tourists to only uh, more, less than 1 million. Uh, that's, le that's almost 90% uh, drop of tourism um, that impacts directly the, uh, the economy, uh, as well as Catalonia. The difference is that Catalonia and, and the uh, region of Occitanie as an internal um, tourist um, touristic uh, um, economy, very very more developed, least more developed than the, the Balearic Islands. But even though uh, our three uh, regions are leader, or at least they are one of the more developed uh, touristic industry in Europe. Third, um, we don't have to forget that even if the um, the cooperation is question of people, it's also a question of territory. And we have more than 35 uh, protected areas. Uh, and if you talk about biodiversity, um, if you talk about um, the, um, the objectives of the sustainable development objective of the United Nations, uh, our area is one of the most uh, delicate, but also uh, protected uh, at the Mediterranean uh, um, Basin. Uh, so that's very important to know that uh, Catalonia, Occitanie, and Balearic Island are leader in some of the 
uh, marine uh, protected areas or mountaineering uh, areas. And last but not least, um, as you may know, the Green Deal uh, that Europe has and the, and the COVID, uh, the funds for the national recovery of every country has put the, uh, uh, the renewable energy as a focus, as a priority. So if you can see, uh, our three governments uh, have the uh, challenge, the uh, objective to be po positive energy regions uh, by 2030. I'm sure that uh, the Ministry of Andorra is really interested by this objective by, because I know that Andorra too want to be a, a positive energy uh, region. So that for us, it's really one of the more um, important issues for the uh, post-COVID uh, uh, crisis uh, following up. So we'll, I will stress it uh, later. Um, so I already said it, we are one of the first EGTC. Uh, for those who don't know what is a EGTC, it's a European Group in Territorial Cooperation. We are a European institution, an international institution with two states, uh, France and Spain, that uh, are recognizing our institution and the European, we are at least 80 European Group in uh, territorial cooperation in Europe, but we're one of the first in 2004 in France and created in 2009 as a formal uh, administration uh, of cooperation, territorial cooperation. And since, as I said, October 23, 2020, sorry, um, the President Delga is our uh, president. Um, let's talk uh, quickly about our four uh, priorities and you will see that it will be uh, directly impacted on our uh, uh, post-COVID um, policy. Um, first of all, um, mainly when you talk about cooperation, territorial, co cross-border, uh, transnational, uh, the problem is that the citizenship uh, are not directly impacted or at least they do not know what we do. Uh, and, and as uh, I heard, uh, when you have, when you have uh, a crisis, a pandemic uh, crisis, as we had, sometimes that the states or Europe decide some uh, um, closing frontiers, borders, but without uh, thinking in the first uh, st uh, stage to the uh, cross-border uh, um, citizens, to the problematic of health and, 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 and transportation services. So what we do is we try to uh, to act and to um, to to be the the the, the, the more um, uh, more likely to uh, answer the question of uh, our everyday uh, problem of the citizens. Uh, um, the municipality is taking care of the of the citizens, but sometimes we we are forgetting what we have to do for them. So that was one of our point is to be um, to be stronger in that aspect and to be. Um, uh, more effective uh, in the efficient in this aspect. Last uh, second point is the innovation, as you say, uh, as I said, uh, the innovation uh, sector is one of the more important for us and was one of the most impacted by the crisis. The, uh, the health innovation sector was one of the um, problem we had at the, init in the initial uh, of the crisis. And so the three governments, as well as a national one in France, and in Spain, but also in Europe, decided to invest more in health. I hope that we will continue in that uh, uh, in that um, sense. And lastly, some of the innovation sector will, will have been really um, uh, touched, or uh, at least um, um, by that in that crisis. This is the uh, uh, all the aspect of um, space uh, in aeronautical and sectors that was of the most impacted by the crisis as well as all the transportation car uh, and car industry that has also uh, suffered from the crisis. Third point is the, the idea of um, to be a more sustainable and uh, resilient uh, uh, territory. As you may know, all the, all the countries, all the states want to be more resilient to the crisis. I think that, will, that is our main objective for the, the years to come. And I will explain uh, in which aspects. And of course, uh, as you may say, uh, know the original was the re re region Pyrenees Mediterranean was created for uh, the cultural, the cross border and the, the cross uh, cultural uh, history that we have between our three 
um, three regions. We have a common history, not a common language, but we can normally uh, speak all together uh, without a problem. Uh, uh, we don't have to speak English normally <laughs> with, uh, with Catalan, Occitan, French, and, and Spain, where we are normally uh, able to, 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 to share our uh, uh, our culture. Uh, just quickly, we are involved in more than seven European projects and uh, we uh, participated in every kind of uh, cooperation, territorial, cross-border, transnational. So we have a, a, ha a high experience in uh, projects uh, uh, over Europe. Um, the total budget uh, yearly is one million and a half and uh, last uh, this year, so as I want to stress, we decided to uh, create a special fund, a COVID fund. Our normal uh, yearly uh, budget for actions, it's around five to 600,000 euros. But this year, we decided to have a specific um, call for the COVID crisis um, in six priorities. The six priorities of this COVID fund, that was, this is the first uh, fund uh, created at a European level, uh, transnational level. Uh, some other URIs and afterwards, after us, uh, created one as our friends from the border from Basque and Aquitanian and Navarra region. But we were the first to create it a cross border fun in these uh, priorities. First, we are eager to help uh, because when we, we suffer this crisis, the first um, point was the health problem. But the second point was the alimentary autosufficiency. Uh, as you may know, um, we had a lot of problem in the fields, in the, in, in the agricultural fields to have um, workers to do the, to do, um, the, the sufficient, the sufficient um, um, season of, uh, of, uh, of agricultural production. So we have a drop of agricultural production in our three regions in, in all over Europe. So what we decided is to, in our call, to intend to help uh, the agricultural sector to have innovation to help such uh, type of crisis. For instance, uh, we, we want uh, that uh, a quality, uh, a following up of quality of the production on the local uh, areas. As you may know, sometimes we do not know where come from the, the products. So we want to be sure that the products are coming from the, the region on a good quality. So we try to uh, help small producers. That's one of the first aspects of the COVID situation. We want to help uh, small, smaller agricultural farmers and not only the big uh, agro-industry uh, ecosystem. The, third, the second point is to help university to continue to, um, to maintain classes to their students. As you uh, know, uh, some of them uh, are uh, Erasmus uh, um, students that were uh, closed in their uh, foreign uh, countries and cannot uh, continue their um, uh, March or April, they cannot continue their uh, classes. So we decided to help university to do uh, online classes on a bilateral uh, cooperation. And so we received more than uh, uh, 10 projects of uh, online cooperation between the university. Martin is uh, a member of uh, one of the uh, more active university at the border, the Université de Perpignan, uh, with Girona. So they work very closely on this base. So as a new region, we have the, the challenge to help university to continue to do high level classes for, uh, uh, for their students on both sides of the frontier of the border. Third point, uh, as I said, uh, the touristic destination uh, was one of the main problems we have. The model uh, that Balearic Island, Catalonia and France and Occitanie as during years was on a, based on a, a massive uh, uh, touristical um, uh, attractiveness. And for 10 years ago, uh, Catalonia, Occitanie, but later uh, Balearic Island decided to change their model, but not quick enough to be prepared to such a strong uh, crisis. 
so now the, the challenge is to, to know how um, change the models, uh, how uh, attract uh, tourists on a small based uh, um, scale. So that was on the more uh, difficult um, challenge we have for the, the 10 years to come. Uh, fourth uh, pillar is uh, to help the youngest creators in the cultural uh, areas because this is the second sector, um, the, the more, uh, um, let's say, uh, um, the more impacted by the crisis. This is a cultural uh, uh, area. Uh, I know that uh, if you know that in Catalonia as well as in Occitanie, they have closed all the theaters, all the all the operas. Uh, I think that the same thing in other regions. So that's one of the the biggest crises uh, we have ever had at the cultural uh, 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 sector. So we decided to help um, young creators to. Uh, to produce digitalized um, production. Uh, that is what we can on our uh, uh, way help this sector. Fifth uh, um, priority, uh, we want to foster um, the environmental sector. Uh, what does it mean by this fostering environmental sector? The problem is that when we have a crisis, sometimes we just think about uh, um, in helping the classical industrial sector, the classical in, um, economical sector, but we forget the environment. And the problem is that the impact of that crisis do not uh, have to, um, uh, to make us forget that the most important thing we are challenging for the 10 years, 20 years to come is the impact of the climate change. And we are Mediterranean mountaineering uh, areas and uh, Andorra, as well as uh, Ca Catalonia and uh, Occitanie and Balearic Island, we will suffer from, from this uh, climate change. So we want uh, our policies not to forget um, the adaptation, the mitigation of uh, climate change. Even if we have the pandemic crisis, we do not have to forget this priority. And last but not least, we, we saw that during the, that crisis, the people who uh, were, well, are suffering uh, right now uh, in Catalonia, but also in France, you know, because they don't have any resources, uh, any, any uh, income. So we decided to foster uh, some uh, reutilization uh, in our secular economy aspect of, um, of clauses for uh, people uh, in risk of uh, um, problematical, social problematical uh, uh, aspect. And we decided to help to one or two projects to include um, people with problems to reuse uh, clauses and to find out some uh, economical uh, um, is um, issues for these people that suffer more than others from this crisis. This is a very challenging uh, plan, but we have a, lot, a few money, uh, only at least uh, uh, for this year, uh, 700,000 euros. We expect next year to put also more, din more uh, money. We expect the, the uh, help from the European Union to support our, our uh, challenging uh, projects. And why not? Uh, I, um, I benefit from the from the presence of uh, our my friend, Minister of the Foreign Affairs of Andorra. Why not uh, having a common project with other uh, partners, stakeholders uh, in this area to to be more efficient and to have more impact for our citizens that are suffering more than others from this crisis. Uh, some some kind fit picture of what we are, uh, even if we cannot uh, travel, it's to remind us that uh, our country is really beautiful. Every country and landscape are very beautiful. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Monsieur Bernard Sanz. Um, there was a first question straight away uh, um, on the Euro Regional Fund, which is, it seems to be a really great idea or a really great initiative to help, as you said, the citizen on the territory. Um, the question was if this money comes from the normal budget or if that's if it's so it's just a change in the budget lines or did the members of the Euro Region decide to put more money on the table to actually create such a fund? 
both both of these. Uh, first, I had to to say that in our global budget, eighty percent is coming from from our three members, and we have some money from the European Union, but just for our projects, European projects. This COVID fund is only from uh, the three governments, and they put extra money. Uh, at least from 50% of this fund is from extra money uh, that uh, they decided to share on a common uh, project. That's really, really, uh, let's say, uh, important when you see that uh, normally uh, the government prefer to invest money first for their, for their country or for their region. So this is really a way to show that a president of Catalonia is, or Balearic Island or Occitania are uh, able to share money to, 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 to find out the solution to this crisis. This is really an example at a small level. It's a, a small European <laughs> project at a, at, at a, at a cross-border uh, level. It's small, but I but think it's very, very useful. <laughs> yes. Would, yeah, it's beautiful. We, we would like to, 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 to to have more money on this fund, but it's a question of capacities because, because we have uh, very, very strong problems in, the, in the each region in, in the economic crisis. Yeah, there was another question concerning these funds. That was, um, can uh, sport activities be funded as well, or can they also use these funds? Because, uh, like uh, sport, like clubs, uh, has been affected a lot also by the COVID, or is that already included in one of the six priorities you mentioned? Regarding sports, uh, to tell the truth, uh, we didn't uh, have this um, sector um, included in the in that first uh, fund. Uh, why not in the future? Uh, we just have cultural. If it is sport linked with culture, that means if it's uh, to to have relations and cultural relations between. Uh, for young people to have a, a, a cultural, but also uh, for languages, uh, uh, it's a cooperation, global cooperation, why not? But sports are not the only way. It's, if it's in session, integration with sports and with cooperation, why not? If it's mm -hmm. only sports, that's not included. So it has to have a cross-border dimension and then it could be possible to fund uh, some- Correct, and if it, yeah. it has an aspect of integration or cultural aspect. Okay. Um, and as I'm, there's a lot of questions in the chat, so I have tried to follow up on them. There was a question about the, um, the universities and how they um, cooperate, or did they use these funds, or do they cooperate in some way to, you know, in times of this crisis? Yes, uh, we, well, uh, to tell the truth, uh, the fund was open from, we, we, we created this fund in only one month, that is really a, a challenge. Uh, from March to April, we opened um, the um, we opened the, the call uh, end of May, and it was open until last week. But uh, in the in the results we have, we have almost ninety projects presented. Ninety projects. Mm -hmm. When I say ninety projects, that means uh, at least uh, three or four hundred uh, stakeholders or more, and that may, that means perhaps uh, 1,000, 2,000 or 3,000 people impacted directly by this fund. Mm -hmm. Regarding the universities on the priority of uh, online classes, we have 10 projects of university that have answered to this call. The response, the answer to this call will be end of November, beginning of December, so, to, so that we can help the project to, to carry on end of this year and it will be all during 2021, okay? The, the fund will, will, will last one year or one year and a half. And we expect to open another one, uh, perhaps more, uh, um, more uh, um, specified on next year. Uh, so yes, uh, definitely university, at least two university have to cooperate so uh, 20 of them, or more than 20 of them, have decided to answer the fund. This is oh. for us really um, a way to show Europe and the states that uh, this is the, the good uh, scale, the good scale of cooperation. I think the better, <laughs> but from my <laughs> point of view. OK, thank you. Uh, I just keep asking you the questions that were coming up in the chat. So there was another question about the cross-border health system. 
and uh, especially the closing of the border policies. Um, was there some cooperation or how has COVID impacted this cross-border health system? And maybe you can say something about the cross-border hospital in Siadania. <laughs> yes. Well, what, what can I uh, say about yes, the, the hospital of, of Siadania? First of all, we, I have to remind that uh, at Brussels, in Brussels, we participated to an expert group to uh, create a mechanism to resolve legal and administrative uh, obstacle at the cross-border uh, context. You have to know that, uh, as said my previous speaker, um, states are not eager, are not eager, I'm not speaking about Andorra, eh? I'm speaking about France and Spain. They are not eager to lose power at the frontier. So, uh, and Europe uh, intends to, um, to explain to the states that it will be better at the cross-border level only to, uh, to have a common law, a common uh, agreement. This agreement is the legal um, mechanism that the DG Rigio, uh, I'm not sure if they are listening, but I uh, really um, uh, uh, agree with them to try to, to change a little bit the habits. Uh, and in that aspect, as we say, the COVID do not know frontiers, <laughs> borders. So if you close a border, uh, it's really um, not a, the best idea. So I think that the states are beginning to understand that the, the better idea as a, is perhaps to involve in these decisions uh, the local key uh, actors as well as we are the region. As far as the health sanitary aspect, um, when they close the border um, at the, between Spain and France, uh, in the first weeks, uh, the border was closed for everyone, except for the um, for the monetizing and for the all the, the commercial uh, relationships. Uh, that was only uh, also for ourselves, the cross-border people. We, I cannot cross the border. The last. As, as if I remember well, three weeks, two or three weeks to change their, um, their minds and to open the border to the cross-border uh, workers only and to health and sanitary aspect. They follow uh, what they, uh, you, you made at the, 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 the border, the German and French border. Uh, so we write uh, all the region of the border, we write to the states, I think that Andorra too, as um, I think the, the minister will explain, but we uh, we manage that to make open the border for some cases we manage, not the region, eh? <laughs> but at European level, we make lobbying that for that this, the, the, the states take into account our local problems. So yes, they do uh, make open the borders, but later uh, for not, not only for LC problem, but also for daily cross-border uh, workers. And, now, and nowadays, right now, I can cross the border whenever I want. Uh, so to tell the truth, uh, I think the states have understood that uh, they cannot have to work close again the, the borders. I think that if they, if they close the border, it will always be open to the, um, the sanitary um, population and also the health population, but also to the cross-border workers. I hope so. Mm. And do you have some, I don't know if you know, some feedback from the Sardinia hospital? Did that work uh, in such a cross-border case well? Or Yes, they well, I heard about it. Mm -hmm. They continue because they don't belong to the Europe. We don't have any con direct contact to, with mm -hmm. the Hospital de Sardinia because the governance is between the Generalitat de Catalonia, the uh, Department de Salud, and, uh, and uh, l'ARS, the Agence Régionale de Santé de, from France. But I know that uh, all, the, or all along the, the crisis, they, um, they receive people, uh, citizens from both sides of the frontier. So it's, mm. it's a case that continue to work uh, even if the crisis. Thank you very much. There was another question. Um, if in this uh, case of the COVID fund, I think it's very interesting <laughs> case for everybody, or a very in interesting example anyway. Um, the question is, is, is there money spent on capacity building or the coordination, once again, of hospitals or emergency services? So it goes a bit in the same direction. Uh, yes, but not at the level of your region, but yes, at the level of the Poctefa. Um, so the Interreg uh, uh, program Inter at your border. Yes, they, they, yes. Uh, last week, 
they, uh, they realized uh, um, uh, on um, on site uh, hospital that can move from one border to the other side of the border. This is uh, I don't remember the, the name of this of this uh, hospital, uh, the Campagne, as we say in France. Uh, and this is the first one in Europe that is able to be created in only one hour. And they, uh, now it is in Bayonne. And I think it's coming to, to Navarra in one month. That's it's a case of uh, capacity building. They form the, um, the service, the, the reanimation, the, the, the urgence of both sides of frontier to, to use this hospital. But this is not from Europe. It's Portefa and it's a working community of the Pyrenees. But it's from, from European Union, as well as uh, it was in the case of the Hospital de, de Sardania de Puchanda. Thank you very much. <laughs> I think it gives well, a really good insight um, into the um, yeah into the region and the cross border cooperation at the, this border. Um, I'm just checking, but I can't see any other questions right now in the chat. There's a lot of very positive reactions of uh, saying thank you to you and 90 projects is very impressive. I was wondering as well if the funds had actually been used, but I think you indirectly answered the question already that the funds that the like the cross border actors actually did use these funds and um, and used the opportunity to you yes, know, to correct. That is great. Thank you so much. Um, I would suggest, if that's okay for everybody, that we take five minutes break so you don't have to leave, leave this uh, session. You just can switch off your cameras and your microphones. And like this, we can all, you know, stretch a little bit behind our screens or get a coffee or <laughs> whatever we have to do. If that's okay with everybody, I would suggest to take just five minutes so very quickly. And then we come back to just very interesting discussions and presentations. And I look very much forward to the presentation from Mario Ubeck from Andorra, which have already, you know, has been mentioned quite a couple of times now. So I think it will complete nicely the picture of your border region. Thank you. Thank you, you so much. <laughs> See you in five minutes. <laughs> okay. Thank you for <laughs> staying with us. Uh, um, so I give the floor again to Martin to introduce Maria. Uba. Okay. Donc je vais vous présenter Maria, qui est la dernière conférencière. Alors Maria Uba qui morte, c'est une femme diplomate et politique andorane. De 2001 à 2006, elle a été la première secrétaire de l'ambassade d'Andorre à Paris et représentante andorane à l'UNESCO. De 2011 à 2017, elle a été ambassadrice d'Andorre en France, puis auprès de l'Union européenne, de l'Allemagne, de la Belgique, des Pays-Bas et du Luxembourg. Et depuis 1900, 2017, pardon, maintenant, elle devient ministre des Affaires étrangères. Donc, je, Anne, tu peux traduire, s'il te plaît Merci. Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you very much, uh, Maria Impact, that, uh, to, to be with us today. I just shortly introduce you, so I translate what Martin said. So uh, we are very happy to welcome you as an Andorran diplomat and politician. Um, from 2001 to 2006, you were the first secretary of the Embassy of Andorra in Paris and the Andorran representative at the UNESCO. And uh, from 2011 to 2017, you were working as the Andorran as ambassador to France, then the, to the EU, to Germany, Belgium, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg. And uh, since uh, 2017, you have been the Minister for Foreign Affairs of Andorra. And thank you so much for being here with us today and for presenting the, uh, you know, the Andorran perspective and how you dealt with the COVID crisis or how you are dealing with this current crisis. Thank you so much. So, uh, good morning, bon dia, uh, bonjour, uh, senor president de l'Institut d'Estudis uh, Catalans, uh, Martina, moltes gràcies uh, per, a, per haver-nos uh, convidat, per haver convidat a Andorra a, a poder participar en aquesta, en aquesta assemblea uh, uh, conferència anual. So first, uh, first of all, also I wanted to thank the Transfrontier Euro, Euro Institute Network for inviting uh, uh, our country, Andorra, to this annual conference. We are very grateful to be here and to share with you uh, the uh, the questions related to the transborder uh, 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 questions. Uh, I will do a, a quick presentation of, of my country, of Andorra, that uh, probably is not very, very well, well known. And, and just to, to give you a, a, 
keys of, of what is uh, our uh, country. And also I, I will uh, explain uh, in the second part the, um, how we, we manage the, uh, the health uh, crisis, uh, COVID-19. And, uh, and then uh, finally, the third part would be uh, to present uh, the, the challenges of, of my country in this, uh, in this uh, situation. So uh, I, will, uh, I will briefly introduce uh, to you uh, our uh, small and old country uh, by giving to you a short uh, description and some figures. Andorra is located between France and Spain in the Pyrenees. Um, just to have an idea, we are uh, more or less 180 kilometers from uh, Toulouse and 200 kilometers from uh, Barcelona, that they are the two uh, main uh, cities uh, close to, to Andorra. Andorra is a parliamentarian uh, co-principality, uh, the only country in the world uh, with uh, two heads of state who represent uh, jointly and indivisibly uh, the people of Andorra. They are the symbol of uh, uh, and the guarantee of Andorran uh, independence. At the present time, we have the two co-princes that they are our head of state, that is, uh, they are uh, the Bishop of La Seu d'Urgell, uh, Monsignor Joan Andrik Vives, and the President of the French Republic, that is uh, Emmanuel Macron. The history of Andorra as a sovereign country is a, a long path. In uh, the 13th uh, century, 1278, to be more exact, uh, we, uh, the, uh, an agreement uh, was, uh, was signed between uh, the Bishop of uh, La Seu d'Urgell and the Count of Foix, and uh, that uh, shaped Andorra as an independent and neutral country. Uh, last year, we celebrate the 600th anniversary of the uh, Conseil de la Terra, that's the Council of the Land, the parliament, parliament that was uh, the highest expression of the self-government uh, since uh, 1419. And, and then very quickly, in 1981, the first executive uh, council was uh, created, the first government. And in, uh, in 1993, the 14th of March, the people of Andorra adopted uh, the first uh, constitution and the Principality of Andorra became a rule of law state and started to participate in the international scene, creating at that time the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The General Council, that means our parliament, exercises the legislative power, approves the budget of the state and controls the political action of, of the government. And it consists of a chamber, one chamber composed by 28 members. The country is divided into seven local administrative divisions known as parishes, uh, and they are managed by its own town, town halls. The territory of the Principality of Andorra covers an area of 468 square kilometers. Uh, we could, if, just to have an image, uh, Luxembourg is 5.5 biggest than Andorra. And, uh, and has an average altitude of 2,000 meters. Due to its particularly uh, geographic and location, only 8 to 10% of uh, its uh, surface area is urbanized and cultivated, and 90% is covered by forests, lakes, rivers, and mountains. The resident population of Andorra is 77 uh, inhabitants, uh, 77,000 inhabitants, sorry. Uh, the Andorran people uh, account for 36,000 uh, inhabitants, followed by the Spanish uh, citizens, more or less 18,000, Portuguese 9,000, French nationals 3,000, and uh, there are other nationalities. In total, we have more or less 100 nationalities that are living in, uh, in Andorra. The official language is the Catalan, uh, even if uh, the Spanish and the French languages are also used. Uh, 
uh, in that sense, we are part of uh, several international organizations, 23, mm, there is the United Nations, the Council of Europe, and also uh, we are part of uh, linguistic organizations as the, uh, as the Organisation Internationale de la Francophonie or the uh, conference, Ibero-American conference, and also we are observer of the community of Portuguese uh, language speaking countries. Andorra's economic activity center is mostly on services. Tourism and commerce are the pillars of our economy. Uh, together with their connected activities, they account more than 45% of our GDP. Uh, before the, the pandemic, uh, the tourism was bringing to us nearly 8 million visitors per year. Uh, foreign trade is very important to the Andorran uh, economic activities. The strong domestic and foreign demand and the relatively low weighting of the Andorra in this industry leads to a high uh, trade deficit and very low export coverage ratio. Another strategic area for the Andorran economy is the financial sector with the banking system at its core. Uh, it contributes to the GDP with about 21%. The first uh, decade after the constitution, we focus on the implementation and of the institutional reforms, uh, such as I was mentioning before, the creation of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that did not exist before 1993, because the two co-princes were in charge of the uh, international affairs of Andorra. Uh, once the institutional and political system uh, that derived from the constitution was fully implemented, we focus on the economic reforms. And uh, we are proud of, of course, of our history, but uh, 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 Andorra is something more than the remainder of the past and we are open to the, the future and com committed to develop uh, some uh, priorities that I will briefly mention to you. There is uh, priorities in terms of finance. Andorra is committed to follow the international standards in tax cooperation. Uh, we sign tax information exchange agreements, double taxation agreements, and we, of course, cooperate very closely with the European Union. Uh, we also participate to the Global Tax Forum of the OCDE. And the last uh, uh, point was uh, on the 26th of October, or when Andorra became member of the uh, International Monetary Fund. Uh, the economic and fiscal reforms permit uh, to our country to, to open our economy, to have access to new markets, to request the level playing field, and we have developed new instruments uh, as the uh, agency that promotes the investments in, uh, in Andorra. Another point that is strategic for, for us uh, is uh, the fight uh, against the climate change. Uh, we are committed to fight again, against the climate change through concrete actions. And uh, in that sense, the Andorran constitution of 1993 was a peer near by including the right of the environment as a citizen's right, and therefore an obligation for the public uh, authorities. That's for sure that the negative effect of the climate change and global warming have been visible for our country. We have to stress that we align uh, our domestic reforms with the international strategy and uh, the fight against the climate change is an essential pillar of the multilateral structure. And Andorra works uh, to fulfill, of course, the commitments of the Paris uh, Agreement. Another point that uh, is interesting to, to stress is uh, that Andorra is proactive in the educational in the education sector. Uh, we are uh, proud to have a rich, diverse, integrating education available to all citizens, uh, a system of which families can opt uh, for the Andorran Spanish or French education, which uh, prepares our young people to become uh, citizens of the world. In that sense, Andorra promotes the education for citizenship through the strong cooperation with the Council of Europe and important efforts have uh, been carried out in Andorra to introduce human rights and democratic values as a part of the academic uh, curriculum of the children and young people. 
And of course, all these actions are in line with the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. Andorra is also proactive uh, from the social uh, perspective. Uh, one uh, of the works carried by Andorra over the last years is to prepare a white paper on equality, and that this is uh, the basis to introduce transversal actions in favor of inclusion from the public sector, as well as from the private sector. And uh, of course, this example that I give to you, and it is one of the last, is uh, the, uh, this white paper uh, has led to the uh, an Equality Act that is a tool to eradicate any situation of discrimination. Uh, the COVID and Andorra, uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and of course that uh, this, uh, this health, uh, economic and social crisis uh, has uh, confirmed one thing, that, that the thing is that uh, is the, the fragility and the dependence of Andorra uh, towards our two neighbors. Uh, you know, geographically, you have to imagine our country uh, as an island uh, surrounded by uh, the mountains and the Pyrenees. And, and of course, uh, the, uh, this, this crisis the, that caused it, the, we talked that before, uh, we, that caused the, the restriction of the, the mobility, uh, especially during the, the first uh, wave, uh, restriction of mobility from France and Spain brought uh, a negative consequences to us as far as the, to the tourism has been totally stopped. Uh, from the 15th of March till the end of May. Uh, only could cross the border, the transborder workers, people who had a health emergency and had to go to hospitals in Toulouse or, or in Barcelona. And I may say that the management of this uh, situation uh, had been absolutely complex. Of course, uh, we were in contact and, and permanent contact with the uh, French and, and the Spanish uh, authorities and uh, and uh, and indeed in normal cr time we can cross the the border um, if we want to go to France or to Spain in it's for us it's totally normal uh, during the COVID crisis uh, that was not possible anymore it's only for a specific uh, uh, situations and and that was the, the first time in our recent history that happened to the uh, Andorran. Uh, society. At the beginning of the crisis, we, we also had to find out medical products as masks and medical uh, respirators. In that sense, uh, we can say that we received the support from the French side, from the, our coprins uh, that uh, helped us to uh, provide us uh, just at the beginning of the crisis uh, with a mask and, and offer also the possibility to transfer patients with COVID to the hospital of Foix, that is a, a city in around one hour, uh, 100 kilometers from, from Andorra. Uh, from the Andorra side, we also cooperate with uh, Catalonia in the sense that we, we also treated uh, dialysis patients from La Seu d'Urgell uh, that they could come to the Andorran hospital. Though it, so in that sense, we, uh, we uh, reinforce this uh, transborder cooperation. Uh, also mention one uh, thing that is a little bit uh, uh, original in a way that it was the first time that we, we, we did a, a thing in that sense is that uh, when we had the crisis at the beginning, the medical professionals from the hospital, the only, only hospital that we have in Andorra because we only have one, uh, we, the, 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 uh, the professionals, uh, they got uh, infected, a lot of professionals, and we needed to find out support in order to cope with, uh, with health uh, crisis. And in that sense, um, contacting the French or the Spanish uh, um, professionals was complicated because the countries, the two countries were also immersed in, a, in an important crisis. And so we, we had to, to find out another uh, solution and the solution is that we ask for uh, help in the Cuban uh, government and the Cuban uh, government uh, sent to us uh, 35 uh, health uh, professionals to, to help us to, to cope with this uh, uh, important crisis. 
Another point is that uh, that was uh, especially the Ministry of Foreign Affairs we that was involved in, the, in that issue it, is that we had to manage to, the return of the Andorran citizens and residents that they were located in the different places of the globe. And, uh, and uh, I may say that uh, in that sense, we, we had to, to deal uh, this situation in a very personal way with the families, with the people that uh, had to, to return to, to our country, especially that the moment, in that moment, the, the borders were closed and the flights are very, very, were very rare. And so that was another point that we had to, to deal uh, uh, with, uh, with the, uh, in order to, to help the, uh, the Andorran citizens to return to, to Andorra. The Andorran economy depends, as I was mentioning at the beginning, on the tourism sector, uh, such an extent that, uh, that, that more than 45% of our GDP is linked to tourism activities. And the government took measures to compensate for the loss of the income experienced by both uh, salaried workers and self-employed business people who were bearing the brunt of the lockdown and the restriction of movement of people, and which consequently affected the move movement of tourism as well. Three laws were enacted uh, within the framework, framework of the extreme emergency procedure, and the purpose of those laws were, was to introduce exceptional measures to help offset the consequences that the health crisis had for the individual and companies. These laws were based on the principles of solidarity and co-responsibility. Prior to the health crisis, the government of Andorra was in a healthy financial situation. Indeed, public debt represent only 34% of the GDP. This situation meant that the government was in a position to implement an ambitious plan costing almost 400 million euros, equivalent to more than 85% of the annual state budget in order to fight COVID-19. The strategy of the Andorran government was based around three different axes. On the one hand, the strategy outlined, it, outlined it, the fight uh, to deal with the pandemic and to stop the spread of the disease, and also to make sure that all our citizens have access to adequate health assistance. The aim of the second axis of action was to help the economic actors uh, in order to avoid a large number of layoffs. Finally, the third axis consider, consisted of providing the social assistance necessary to maintain the social cohesion of society and to make sure that no one was omitted or left behind. The government made 40 million euros available to finance self-employed uh, business people and employees in order to prevent redundanc re redundancies and the destruction of the business fabric. Did what, that was really the first time of our history that such decision was taken. In fact, more than uh, 1,000 uh, companies uh, were able to benefit from this initiative and had a direct impact on more than 30,000 employees that equal 44% of all the employees. The government budgetary efforts had been uh, considerable, as, a, as I was saying. And uh, uh, as a way of example, we also introduced uh, the zero rate credits uh, to the tune of 230 million euros to allow companies to refinance their loans and to help them uh, with their operating costs. This allowed the companies to benefit from aid and to defer the payment of uh, their electricity, telephone and internet bills. In particular, the government took charge of employers' contribution to the social security for those employees who had been uh, for loath and as a result of the uh, lockdown. Most of the decrees implemented to create these economic measures were scheduled to continue till the 20, 31st of December 2020, but plans are already in place to have to extend them. 
in allowance an allowance also corresponding to the minimum minimum wage was paid to the parents who had to stay at home during the lockdown period so that they could look after their children under 14 years old or children with disabilities these allowance continued to be paid in those cases where the children had to be quarantined as a result of having come into contact with person with a person tested positive a child care service was also put in place uh, from the from the end of april to the end of may for parent working in essential services um, the first step of uh, the strategy implemented during the health crisis consist, consisted of a serological testing campaign during the month of April and May to test for SARS-CoV-2, and it covered the entire Andorran population. Despite being voluntary, the campaign was backed by more than 90% of the population. And since the months of April, people showing symptoms of uh, SARS-CoV-2 have been given a PCR or TMR, TMA test to see if they have the disease. In that way, more than 6,500 uh, TMA tests were carried out in eight month period, in addition of uh, 14,000 PCR tests. Also, there were some measures uh, taken in uh, for the uh, for the students and and the uh, professionals uh, working in schools that they were uh, called for a testing during the first week of September, just be, just before the beginning of uh, schools. And in that sense, also uh, a big uh, majority of the uh, of the um, the professionals working and, and children were tested. Uh, another another point that we had to face during uh, this health uh, crisis is related to the uh, seasonal workers in uh, in Andorra. We employ in winter time uh, more than five thousand uh, seasonal workers, and and those workers that represent more or less six point four uh, percent of our population. Uh, many of those workers are coming from the countries of Latin America. And uh, when we enter lockdown uh, in mid-March, we went to great uh, length to help seasonal workers to uh, return to their, uh, to their country of origin, mainly Argentina and Chile. More than 2,000 Seasonal, seasonal workers uh, were not able to return home because uh, you know that the, the traffic, uh, aerial uh, traffic was uh, closed, especially to those countries. And in that sense, the government of Andorra extend their residence permits and as well as their social security coverage. Uh, we, we had to arrange also accommodation for those uh, workers and provide them with financial and food uh, uh, aid. In, uh, in the uh, educational level, many efforts also were made to help uh, alleviate the effects of the closing of all educational centers from 16 March to the 1st of June, distant lear distance learning courses were set up uh, and the Ministry of Education established a system to lend computer equipment to those uh, students who needed it in order to prevent inequalities between uh, children. Uh, also, child care service for young children was also set up for the parents uh, employed in key sectors and, uh, and uh, in that sense uh, uh, also, the families uh, receive uh, uh, payments uh, corresponding to the uh, school, school transport uh, in order to reimburse the, uh, the amount of money that they had to pay at the beginning of the year. Uh, so, so those are, in a general way, the, the actions and measures that the Andorran uh, government took place during the, um, the first wave, and, and those measures are keep on uh, during this uh, second wave of the of the COVID, uh, what are the challenges for for our country? And in that sense, I'm going to to fix uh, the uh, the explanation, especially with uh, the the challenges related to the uh, 
uh, negotiation of uh, the, uh, the association agreement that we are now doing with the European Union. And that is uh, one challenge. And then the, the other challenge is to promote also the cooperation, the transborder cooperation. Concerning the European Union and the cooperation of Andorra with the European Union, I have to say that since uh, 2015, uh, Andorra and the European Union, we are negotiating an association agreement. Uh, we negotiate this agreement together with Monaco and, and San Marino. And the objective of this uh, agreement is the participation to Andorra of Andorra in the single market of the European Union, while of course respecting uh, our specificities and in line with the Declaration 3 of the Article 8 of the Treaty of the European Union. Uh, indeed, the level of market access should be comparable to that enjoyed by the uh, European Economic Area member states as Liechtenstein, uh, Norway or Iceland. The agreement will, will be a mean uh, for the transformation of Andorran economy that will bring uh, new opportunities and will uh, hopefully help us to create new uh, sect activity sectors. One of the Andorran main weaknesses is an uh, undiversified economy. As I was mentioning, uh, our economy is mainly based on tourism. So now what we have to work is on uh, diversifying our economy and uh, participating in the internal market should foster the sustainability and the diversification of our, our economy. What, within the, the context of the, the health crisis, we reaffirm that the association agreement is a strategic priority as it should allow access to the internal market and, and also provide us for financing mechanisms in order to reinforce the resilience of the Andorran economy and for the moderniz modernization of the uh, cooperation outside the four, uh, four freedoms. The other priority of the government is that the association agreement provides the participation of Andorra to EU programs and establishes financial modalities for cooperation outside those uh, four freedoms. And of course, the co contribution should be adapted to the territorial, demographic and economic dimension of our country. Given uh, its history and uh, geographical location, its economy, its society, and its values, Andorra is uh, very is linked to the and it's uh, considered as a, as an European country. Uh, Andorra can represent a, a chance to show that in those times of uh, uncertainty, constructive constructive and harmonious uh, relations between the EU and a third state can also be established. And Andorra would like to reinforce the principles or, and the values that the European Union represents. We believe that this crisis is also an opportunity for the European Union to show a spirit of cooperation and solidarity with one of the closest neighbors and partners and to help build a sustainable common future. Another challenge uh, for us is to promote and to reinforce the transborder cooperation. Uh, the, the crisis showed that we had to do that and we had to, to find out um, projects to, to help the uh, territories and the, the population of, of, uh, our, uh, of our country and the, the regions from France and, and, and Catalonia. And in that sense, uh, we, we have organized our transborder cooperation uh, in a bilateral way. Uh, for example, we have a, a very close cooperation with the region of Occitanie. And in that sense, uh, we, uh, we have um, very regular, every, in fact, every year we, there is a, a meeting uh, of dialogue, cooperation dialogue, uh, Occitanie and or uh, that is organized with uh, the Prefecture d'Occitanie and uh, the local elected uh, representative from the, Depart the Département de l'Ariège et des Pyrénées Orientales. Uh, this uh, cooperation generates a roadmap with concrete projects in the context of the road infrastructure, environment, agriculture, education, and tourism. Uh, 
uh, we organize since uh, 2017, as I was saying, an annual meeting of Citani Andor, shared by the head of government of Andorra and the prefet of La Région d'Occitani and the representative of the chairman, chairwoman of the uh, region Occitani. In that sense, uh, last uh, 23rd of October took place the meeting here in Andorra. And uh, the objective of the both of both delegations was to promote concrete activities in order to bring together economic uh, players and public officials. And uh, this, um, what we considered in that meeting, it was to create a, a working group, especially in the health uh, uh, area, especially now, uh, and also a working group on tourism and environmental and agricultural sector. The transborder cooperation with Catalonia is also very important for us. Uh, Andorra has very close ties with Catalonia. We share a language, we share a culture, and many Andorran people have family relationship with uh, Catalonia. We have signed several memorandum of understanding in the context also of environment, culture, innovation, education within others. The airport of La Seu d'Urgell uh, is one of the main projects uh, on the table to today and uh, is a very small uh, airport and that already obtained the flight uh, permit and hopefully uh, we will be able to organize very soon uh, a domestic and international schedule. That is also very important in order to, to uh, help us to, uh, to, to connect Andorra uh, to, uh, to other countries more easily. The transborder cooperation with the working uh, community of the Pyrenees is also a one way of uh, transborder cooperation for us. Andorra is part of the working community of the Pyrenees, uh, a political organization together with uh, six other partners from Spain and France. Uh, in 2005, France and Spain signed an agreement to create the consortium of the working community of the Pyrenees, and and uh, is that this agreement permit to the uh, to the working community of the Pyrenees to be managing uh, authority of the oper operative program of border cooperation Spain France Andorra Poctefa. In 2010, Andorra, uh, Spain and France signed a, a protocol to, to the uh, agreement that permits Andorra also to participate to this consortium. Andorra has chaired twice the uh, working community of the Pyrenees in 1998-1999 and 2013-2015. And during the program uh, POCTEFA 2007-2013, uh, Andorra participated in four transborder projects. Of course, we cannot receive money directly as we are not members of the European Union, but we can participate to those projects and it's something very useful uh, for, for our uh, sectors here in Andorra and different actors. In the program POCTEFA 2014-2020, Andorra participated to 31 projects and made a financial contribution of more than 2 million euros. And today, uh, we also participate very actively on the elaboration of the POCTEFA 2021-2027, an aspect that the creation of a functional area that will cover the transborder territory of Andorra with uh, Catalonia and, and, uh, and, uh, and Occitania, especially Ariège and Pyrénées Orientales, will be a reality and will be able to develop, that will be able to, for us to develop concrete projects uh, with an important impact for uh, the territory. During the last plenary of the, uh, the uh, community uh, of the Pyrenees that took place uh, last October, the seven partners adopted a declaration that pointed out the importance of the Pyrenees strategy, uh, in particular in the health, young heritage cultural issues, and uh, also the, uh, we, we stress the importance of the progr programming process for the new POCTEFA. Andorra is also part of the program SUDOE. And also another point that I wanted to stress is that the transborder cooperation goes also through the uh, international organizations and more precisely uh, through the UNESCO. 
for example, we have the summer solstice fire festival uh, that takes place in the Pyrenees that has been inscribed in 2015 on the representative list of the intangible cultural heritage of humanity of the UNESCO. We are now also working together with France and Spain to prepare other UNESCO candidatures uh, to the World Heritage List and also to the Intangible Cultural Heritage List of the UNESCO. And um, to conclude, uh, I just wanted to say that, of course, uh, the health crisis uh, totally transformed uh, our country. Uh, uh, we need, of course, through this, uh, this crisis to adapt ourselves to the new reality. And, and there is one thing that is uh, very complicated for the, for the Andorran government is to foresee the situation. You know, we, 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 we have to, to see how the situation is, is going day by day, and it's difficult to, to make a, a planification. Uh, but in any case, even if it's, that is, is hard, we have to, you know, to, to work in order to, to find a balance between preserving uh, the economy and the social situation and also the, the health uh, situation. And that's, it's, uh, it's a very difficult exercise. Uh, we have uh, established a strategy uh, of being a, a leading country uh, in its diagnostic capacity. Uh, today, we, 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 we can do more than 8,000 uh, tests uh, uh, during one, one week. And uh, we have also a very efficient uh, traceability capacity, uh, thanks of the uh, number of tracers uh, that, uh, that they can make a, a very uh, serious follow-up. And also, there is a, another challenge that we have to face the winter with a maximum of safety and quality guarantees, uh, both for the residents and for the tourists that hopefully will be able to, to come again to, to Andorra. Uh, we are now finalizing protocols to apply from December, uh, and, and hopefully that will be the, the, the moment that we will be able to receive uh, tourism, especially, I suppose, tourism from France and Spain, not touring that they, they, it will be more difficult to receive tourism that will come from, from, for, from other countries. What uh, brought the health uh, crisis? Uh, that uh, it's just an analysis, a very uh, quick analysis, uh, that, that the transborder corporations need to be reinforced. And for sure, uh, that will be positive for our country, our territory, but also for our neighbors. How to cooperate is through the POCTEFA program, to the, through the Pyrene, uh, Pyrenees strategy and uh, of, the, of the working community of the Pyrenees. And then the diversification of the economy is now really necessary. Um, I'm sure that through the uh, through this uh, health crisis, there will be new sectors that will be developed uh, probably in the area of the health and the innovation. And so that is um, a very short uh, explanation of, of, of what we have been done. I could talk about other things, but, uh, but I, of course I am open to, to questions, uh, to clarifications if uh, you, it's needed. Thank you very much for the attention. Thank you very much, uh, Maria Ubak, uh, for this presentation and uh, all the explanations and uh, like especially presenting all the different measures that the Andorran government has been putting in place. Um, there's a few questions that I would ask, to like to ask you straight away from the chat. So there was a question whether there were any specific issues arising from the imposition of travel restrictions, bearing in mind the significant, significant presence of migrant workers in Andorra, such as those from Portugal. Did these restrictions cause any problems for these migrant populations? So, well, restriction, in fact, in Andorra did not close the borders, ne never. Uh, but of course, we are, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the consequences of uh, the, 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 what they made, uh, make the neighbors uh, has uh, direct consequences to, to us. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so of course, um, we have a, a community of Portuguese people and, and 
during the, the first wave, uh, it was difficult for them uh, to the community who is in Andorra to travel to, to Portugal. Of course, it was if it, if it was not for a, a very specific reason, they reason they could not do that. But uh, but well, we, we suffer, of course, of the uh, of this uh, situation of uh, limitation of uh, uh, circulation and mobility. Uh, that was uh, one point positive as uh, is that the circulation of the goods was uh, was uh, they, they continue to 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 circulate so it was uh, positive but but that's true that the circulation of and the mobility of the people was uh, was a, a very uh, important uh, difficulty for for our country Thank you very much. Another question was more related to the, um, the association or the negotiation around the association and the EU membership or not, and how you can participate in programs or not. Uh, I read it out to you. So do you have any advice on what is needed for good cross-border cooperation between Andorra, a third country, and EU member states? What would you advise the UK in this regard? <laughs> you know, we have some members who come <laughs> from different borders. <laughs> Difficult question. Difficult question because, uh, of course, uh, the, the situation of the UK has uh, has a consequences on on our negotiation, uh, and, uh, okay. and, and uh, of course, when uh, the, uh, the the negotiation of uh, the going out of the UK uh, uh, made our negotiators, uh, the EU negotiators, that they are very, um, uh, I mean, uh, the negotiations are are, are quite hard. And made the negotiations more uh, more difficult, and and okay. of course uh, in our in our case, you know, we are a very small state. Uh, we are only seventy seven thousand inhabitants, uh, and of course, uh, what uh, we would like and what we we ask in the negotiations is, uh, of course, to participate to the internal market, uh, like a little bit the the, the, the same situation uh, that has uh, Liechtenstein, Norway, or, or or Iceland, but of course. The, the, the hard part of the negotiation is that we ask them to the European Union to, to take into account our specificities. And that's the hard. And, and, and I, I, honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm not able to, to give any advice, especially to the UK that is a, a, a big and, 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 and very experienced uh, country. Uh, but but we, can, we can share, I, I'm sure, experiences also. And, and, and we, can sh we can see also what the UK is doing and inspire ourselves. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, there's no other questions in the chat right now, so I'm just checking. I thank you very much for your presentation and uh, really this insight. I think it's really interesting to you know to have the three perspectives uh, on the same border and uh, how you, how this crisis was managed. And um, uh, I would like maybe to close uh, with uh, some more general. Martin, I think I see you want to say something. You just have. To, Il faut juste que tu mets ton micro, Martin. Oui, je voudrais poser une question à Maria. Yes. Alors, je lui, je lui dis en français, après tu traduiras comme ça. Oui. Donc, euh, Maria, euh, je voudrais savoir, est-ce que tu penses que euh, Andorre peut servir de modèle, étant un petit État, est-ce qu'Andorre peut servir de modèle euh, par rapport à la crise sanitaire que nous avons actuellement en Europe, comme elle est un modèle dans d'autres domaines so the question is, uh, if uh, Andorra can be a model, it's a very small country, but it can be a model for the European Union in the management of this crisis. So thank you for, for the question. And, um, and of course, our, our strategy in this, in this crisis uh, was uh, to, to make some uh, uh, campaign of testing. And, and, and that was uh, our, our way of, of doing, but of course, maybe uh, uh, as far as we are small that that uh, strategy uh, of campaign of testing is is maybe easier for us for once you know being a small uh, can be positive you know because normally it's it's not the, the case but uh, but testing uh, is is one of the uh, the, the main uh, issues uh, for us and, 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 and of course, making the traceability of the people who are uh, with, uh, that have um, uh, COVID. And, and of course, we, can, we, we could uh, in, um, transfer this, uh, this, uh, this uh, situation and this, uh, this sort of a strategy to uh, maybe to the, um, 
territories that they are close to to our our country in in that sense i, I think that the, at the end our our, our model can can be uh, shared and can be used by by also the other territories and 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 that at the end i, I think that the this crisis show us that uh, the the transborder cooperation uh, i said that during my my presentation is so important and now we we have to work closer we have to install uh, uh, mechanisms in order to to make easier this uh, connection between our territories and in, of course the health uh, sector and area is one of the of the of the areas that we need to to work and and to 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 exchange experiences we can be a model but not only ourselves but we can inspire also ourselves of what is doing uh, in the in the region and uh, and i think in that in that sense we will be able to be stronger and not only ourselves but also the the closest territories in in france and spain i think that uh, we we can arrange uh, an area uh, uh, and in this area, I think that the, the, the combination of the work within our, our three uh, can, can be uh, useful and, and positive. And that's why we are now uh, working very hard uh, in, the, in the constitution of the, the, the program POCTEFA 2021-2027 to create fu a functional area. And, and that we are, we are really um, asking for, for that because this functional area with uh, uh, very transborder areas from Andorra and uh, the Catalonia and, and Occitanie will be, I am sure, uh, an important tool to develop uh, trilateral projects uh, for the, for the well-being of the population because at the end we work for that for the for um, making the life better for the for this uh, for the population of this region that is a very difficult region because of the the geography at the end we are a country of, of the Pyrenees I was saying you, you know is like an island in the case of Andorra but the, the territories that they are close border to Andorra also they are territories that they are a little bit alone uh, and far away from the capitals so uh, so if Andorra can help and 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 and, and work together with those those territories, I, I'm sure that uh, that it will be positive for the for the well-being of all of us. I don't know. Thank you. Thank you very much. Was there any reaction? I think, uh, Mr. Bernard, you wanted to say something, maybe. No, j just uh, asking. So, uh, to our minister, uh, uh, perhaps another question about okay. the, the 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 legal mechanism uh, at the European level, perhaps to to ask uh, Andorra to. To, to talk with uh, his colleagues from Spain and France to, to say that uh, uh, we have uh, actors that can be, uh, uh, let's say, the, 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 the key actors to help states to, to solve the problem at legal uh, at the border, the cross-border frontier, as you say, about uh, functional areas, but also perhaps administrative and legal uh, uh, problems. Uh, Andorra is not yet member of the uh, European Union. I hope you will enter very soon. But uh, perhaps you can help to, to to solve some problems or to to to, te to tell your uh, to others colleagues from the state that uh, perhaps the borders have to be more taken into account in their in their legal and administrative uh, issues. Yes, we 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 are working on that. But uh, I may assure you that sometimes it's not uh, easy, you know. Uh, we, I, have I, complex, I do understand. we have the complex of uh, a small and tiny state. So, um, you know, <laughs> the, 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 the work is, is not uh, easy, but uh, the, we have, of course, a very good dialogue with our, uh, with our uh, the authorities, the French and, and Spanish uh, authorities, for, for sure. And, and, and I think that at least we have the dialogue and, and then we have to, to work and insist of the the, the necessity uh, to, to, to have these uh, borders uh, um, well work better and, and, and in order to, to, to help also the, uh, the connection between the, the territories. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions, any other questions to Maria Ubak? Otherwise, I would like to open the floor to the participants. Um, 
uh, if you want to ask any other questions or make any remarks, uh, you can actually raise your hand and then we can give you the floor. Um, maybe while you're thinking about some comments or questions, or <laughs> I wanted to ask maybe our three speakers a more general question, maybe, um, uh, I mean, from your point of view, what maybe, uh, what did your institutions or, you know, what can we learn in general from the first uh, wave of this uh, crisis for managing the second wave? Would you have any, uh, you know, comments or ideas on this? Well, I can start maybe. Yeah, would you like to start? Very good. Well, just, uh, just because well, we, we have learned, of, of course, of the uh, well, when we when the, the first wave uh, arrived, it was something that uh, we didn't expect at all that uh, that could happen to to us, and uh, and and of course we have to to take decisions and react very very quickly, to take decisions one day for another, and probably some some of the decisions were taking in this uh, in this precipitation. Uh, now in this uh, second wave, of course, uh, we uh, we know a little bit more about the the uh, the, the COVID nineteen. Uh, we are now also working on the uh, on the vaccine, uh, the treatment, and 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 of course that is uh, I'm sure that is uh, uh, more easy easy to 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 deal. Even of course the uh, the consequences that brings uh, this. Uh, health uh, crisis to the economy and to the social situation is is very hard and, and difficult but uh, i'm sure down the on the health uh, area we we have learned a, a little bit more and and we can so as a consequence take some decisions and, and measures uh, in knowing the the, the the situation thank you very much yeah. Yes, yeah, if I may um, add, uh, perhaps for us, the, the main, uh, let's say, uh, thing we have learned is uh, perhaps to adapt our uh, knowledge of uh, every government uh, policies. Mm -hmm. What I mean is that we are organized by commissions, sectorials and thematic commissions, and we, like a small observatory of our both three governments and the states, uh, um, recovery uh, national plans and European uh, European recovery plans of COVID. So every two months we uh, update our knowledge of uh, uh, economical aspect issues, health issues, and that uh, helped us to reorient it or to target our uh, action plan. And we are right now working on our 2021 action plan, and we are already uh, well changing or perhaps as said. Uh, uh, the Minister of Affairs, we're trying to, to, to learn from, from our, not heroes, but perhaps our efficiency, and we want not to be, uh, uh, not prepared as we were when arrived the first uh, wave. So uh, in our case, it's more likely to uh, readapt our action plan to the reality because every week, every day, the reality is changing, it's mm -hmm. changing, uh, not only on the health aspect, we are more uh, more focused on the economical aspect, social aspect, because the health aspect is more on uh, in France you know, at the national level. So we do not have any key on this uh, issue, more less than economy, social and environmental aspect. Thank you very much. Mr. Domingo, would you like to add anything? It's very important to, to learn the lesson of the importance of public statistics in, uh, in the way to, to fight against the uh, pandemic, because uh, you need to know uh, what is happening. And uh, one of the problems is uh, with very different statistics and uh, you suffer from uh, credibility and uh, has a, a price to, to pay in the security of the state uh, in this, uh, in this way, uh, the European states, and, but also in other levels of administration, have to accelerate the linkage of administrative uh, registers and the statistic of population. I think it's the most important from a uh, statistic point of view. 
Thank you. There is a question coming up in the chat exactly around the, the question of statistics, <laughs> but maybe a bit larger. So um, uh, there's the question is, have you encountered, or maybe, um, I mean, it's a question to all three of you, but maybe Mr. Domingo, you want to try to answer first. Um, have you encountered any problems in terms of assessing the impact of COVID in your regions and the comparability of data between the regions? There is a, a big problem uh, in, in Spain. We have now the problem of, uh, of comparability, uh, not knowing really what is happening in the different regions because uh, one has the suspicion that the, the, uh, some regions are hiding the results of the impact. But uh, I think it's not so clear that they were hiding the, the statistics. I think they are managing in different ways and different statistics. And uh, there is not an homogeneous uh, way to work with the statistics. And, uh, and sometimes there is different sources of the statistics. And this is, this is for me worrying. Uh, not only in the case of the different regions of Spain is uh, something that you, you can uh, find out in other uh, places, or other countries, or other states. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Bernard. <laughs> no, I confirm that that was the main problem to to compare statistics. Uh, in French, it's easier because uh, <laughs> the the monopole of the the. The, 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 st the statistic uh, in, uh, um, economy is from the INSEE or from the LRS in that case. So in French, it's harmonized. In, in, but the problem is that between states is not harmonized. And, and, and uh, every state focused on one element or another. And it depends on one state to the other. So for us, that was really difficult. But we try to manage. And we have a, 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 a global statistic at the regional level. We try to. To, to find out uh, the good uh, or the comparison, the good comparison, but it's not uh, so easy. Uh, but I think it's one major point, crucial point, no? to compare what we can compare. Mm. Thank you very much. It's interesting that you say you have some new region statistics. So you are like in the new region, you have somebody trying to uh, get data together, gather data together to do some trans what? cross border statistics. Well, we just try to, to cross, yes, the statistics yeah. from each country or okay. each region, and we try to find out the common, uh, we don't have uh, special or personal or uh, own statistics, so, but we mm. can tr to synthesize no? and, and, and okay. what we have from every member or every state's member. Okay, so you try to make a global picture out of it and try to compare what is more or less comparable. <laughs> comparable, correct. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Maria Upak, would you like to add anything to this point? You, uh... Yes, thank you. Well, concerning the statistics, uh, as far as we are concerned, is, is a big issue also. And, uh, and, and of course, uh, we, we had to, to readapt and, and to work on, on, on having uh, the data, uh, the data of, of our country. And of course, the data is, is essential in order to to, to take after the uh, the decision. So uh, that's a, a point that we, we had to work at in internally uh, in Andorra to, to get the, the statistics. And, and now well, we, can, we can share also the, uh, the data uh, on the website of the government. We have the data concerning the, um, the health uh, situation. So, but that was a, a critical point also at the, at the beginning. Hmm. Thank you very much. Um, is there any other questions? Uh, if you have any, if any of the participants have any other questions, feel free to either raise your hand or put it in the chat. I leave a little minute just to see. <laughs> no, I think there's no other questions coming up. Ah, here is another one. <laughs> so does Andorra face any particular obstacles in, in sharing data cross border with EU member states? So that's coming back to the statistics question. Maybe I, yeah, if yes. you want to answer, Maria. <laughs> Yes, uh, in fact, we the um, the European Center of Prevention uh, that is uh, managing all the European data, Andorra cannot uh, send 
officially the data because there is no agreement uh, with uh, with uh, this uh, center. However, we know that the center um, takes uh, the information from our website. But uh, that's again a situation that, it, that is a little bit strange that uh, as far as we are not EU member, we cannot have a, a direct contact with the European Center of, of Prevention and, and Data. But we know that they 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 take the uh, the information but uh, but for us it would be uh, really very useful to to get uh, a direct uh, relation with uh, with the center of data of the european union uh, because at the end uh, we are in the middle of uh, two uh, eu member states and 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 of course uh, the, the the having uh, the the data and uh, the new the, the the reality of the situation it, it could be very useful for for us also especially that they there are so those those maps uh, with the green, uh, red, and zones, and and so uh, so in that in that sense, it's important to to give the the good information. Mm. Thank you very much. There is another question to all three speakers. Um, do you support the ideas of the European Commission on a health union? <laughs> Would anybody of you like to <laughs> to say what you think about? <laughs> Uh, well, in my case, uh, if, if we take the, the example, always the same example of the Hospital de Puchardá, it's cl clear, quite clear that the, the solution is to have a uh, pan-national vision of the health, but at a local area. I'm not sure make myself understand. Uh, I mean that uh, even if states have to, to take uh, the harmonization of the health uh, aspect, I think that they have to adapt uh, their policies, like legal, at the border, at the border frontier, at the frontier or cross border areas. So I think that the only um, level to decide on this aspect is uh, European Union. I think that if European Union propose uh, the change uh, for frontiers, borders, uh, health uh, reg uh, regulation, that could be great. We see that it, it works and it works very good between the Catalonia and the state, the French state in the case of uh, Sardinia. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Domingo, would you like to answer to this question? No, really. No, <laughs> not really, okay. <laughs> no, no, a clear idea of what ideas have the European Union on, on Commission on the Health. Okay. Uh, I prefer not to. Or maybe another final statement before we wrap up uh, this uh, conference. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I think that the, the main reason is to share knowledge and good practices and not mm. fears. Yes. Uh, and that uh, local uh, knowledge can be useful for the uh, European Union as well. Thank you very much. <laughs> Maria Upek, uh, would you like to add anything to the question or maybe another final remark before we wrap up the conference? No, uh, in the same way that Mr. Domingo was was saying uh, in the fi final, I think that the European Union can can take uh, uh, positive uh, policies uh, if they take into consideration what is happening on the territories, uh, and that's the the way of of working because at the end uh, the the people are the ones that they live the situations and they and 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 what what the people need is to to help them to, to find solutions. And, uh, and um, uh, the practical part is, is something that has to be referred to the uh, to European Commission. And, 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 and uh, I think that is uh, the way of, of doing. Uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, that, that would be, I, I think, something useful and, and positive also for the uh, European institutions. Thank you very much. Would you like to add a final remark, Monsieur Bernard Sanz? <laughs> Oh, no, to tell that, that uh, I think that such a uh, um, I think a conference is, is in, interesting to to cross uh, uh, views and ideas of uh, what could be the better uh, co territorial cooperation, and we see that uh, to act local, uh, even if we have um, to have uh, an harmonization uh, between the states, it's the better way to be efficient, uh, to be the, the more likely to impact. Uh, the day-to-day -day life of our citizens. Thank you very much. I would really like to thank you all very, very much for your presentations, for the discussion. Um, 
I ah there she is Martina I was worried that she was not going to be there anymore to wrap up the conference <laughs> so I thank you very much for taking the time to discuss with us today I think it's really really important as you said I mean I can only agree with you to share the uh, practices ideas uh, from different borders and um I would really like to thank you in the name of all TAIN members to having uh, participated in this uh, conference today. Uh, I thank all my colleagues from the TAIN network who have been there and I also thank all the other participants for all your questions and uh, your remarks uh, and I think it's really interesting always to share and uh, I'm very happy that we managed to see each other in this format even if it's online and I look forward to maybe meeting you <laughs> next year or on another occasion in, um, in reality and and, uh, yeah, make your acquaintance. Thank you very much, and I pass uh, the floor to Martin for you know for the last word. Thank you very much. Thank you to you all. Okay. Je voulais d'abord uh, vous remercier uh, aux trois conférenciers qui ont qui nous ont donné des interventions extrêmement intéressantes, uh, aux participants aussi uh, qui sont qui ont été uh, nombreux, et je voudrais aussi uh, remercier Ernest uh, qui est le technicien. Euh, du Zoom qui a été pour nous euh, là depuis 8h30 du matin et qui euh, nous a permis de nous retrouver donc les uns et les autres. Merci à tous pour cette conférence, pour l'assemblée d'hier, pour la conférence d'aujourd'hui. Euh, merci surtout à tous les trois d'avoir joué le jeu et de nous avoir passionnés par ce qui se passe donc dans notre petit territoire certes, mais euh, peut-être le plus intéressant <laughs> so I may take the word for final translation of what Martin said. So she said, thank you very much to the speakers uh, for the very, very interesting uh, exchange in the presentations. Thank you for the participants for uh, having, you know, participated. And also a big thank you to Ernest. Also thank you, Ernest, from my side. And um, um, she looks looking forward to all and um, other exchange and she thinks that um, the border between Andorra, Spain and uh, France is really a very interesting border to discuss these uh, questions in the current times. Thank you very much, Martin, and thank you very much to the IEC having uh, an, uh, organized this annual conference this year. And I look very much forward to meeting you all again soon. <laughs>